I didn't start. I I Oh, no, I'm sure that's Oh, it's one of my Instagram. I'm thinking about it. That's where I write all of you on Instagram. It must be Okay, I think we'll get started. So, we're going to think about writers and readers and the question of narrative craft. So we're going to now talk more about the technical side of writing. Um, should the reader matter? You know, if you ask most authors like me, we'll say, oh, we never think about the reader when we write, which is <laughs> until we publish our work. And then, of course, we want readers, you know? But um, you know, eventually, you want to do that. So the question I'll just put out here for you to think about, how do you write your narrative how do you craft it so that you know the reader reads you know the first few sentences and will continue, will want to continue reading on? Because that's part of what engaging the reader is. So we're gonna do some reading exercises this time to do that. Um, Stephen King, who I'm sure you've all heard of, actually wrote uh, a, this book is it's now in its like I don't know, 10th or 11th edition, and a lot of people use it for teaching. Um, I'm right, but it's actually a memoir. He wrote it after a terrible accident where he was almost killed. And so in his convalescence, he wrote about writing. <coughs> Stephen King, and then, you know, when the book came out originally in 2000, um, he was interviewed about it, and um, the reporter at the New York Times, Stephen Dubner, back in 2000, had this to say about Stephen King, that he is addicted to writing. It isn't a matter of liking to write or even loving it. He needs it chemically. The way years ago he needed his cocaine and his beers, sometimes a case a day. He used to be a very addictive person. <laughs> He's not anymore. He actually got away from that, which is pretty cool. And he says, writing is just this great big conduit, this outflow pipe that keeps the pressure nice and even. It just pours all this expletive. So probably meant something like shit out. <laughs> all the insecurities come up, all the fears. And also, it's a great way to pass the time. <laughs> you know, writing can be fun, and I think I, I just wanted to sort of mention that, but the idea of reading and writing a lot, that's really what it's about. So, you know, for your own narrative areas that you're writing in, obviously you probably read those, that literature. But you might expand your reading to the more obvious places where narrative is, in stories or in creative knowledge. This is not that. Um, Nabokov again, you know, he gave a series of lectures on good readers and writers. He first gave these at Wellesley, then he gave it later at Cornell. Um, he really emphasized the idea of rereading. And um, I think too many writers, and myself included, we think our first drafts are the most brilliant work we've ever written. <laughs> and first drafts, I can tell you, categorically, is just crap. Okay? And it's the same with reading. We read initially to just get all that information in, to read the story, to find out what happened, whatever, okay? To get all the facts and all that. But, you know, in a good piece of writing that you're reading, um, when you reread, you engage with the language and the story and the ideas the writer is trying to put across much more closely. I make it a point of rereading all those books that were very influential to me over the years to see if they still hold up. So every 10 years or so, I'll reread Lolita. Every few years, I'll reread this book or that book. Some hold up, some don't. That's the best I can say. And it's quite interesting to see what does and what doesn't. Alice in Wonderland still holds up forever. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Um, so also I think the idea of an artistic and scientific balance. Because, you know, part of writing, especially when I ask you to come, just sit here and write, is like just put out whatever is there. You can always throw it away. But at some point you have to be a little bit more scientific about it and say, okay, what's good, what's not, what can I throw out? Okay. So I think craft of it is really 
to figure out what is it I really want to say, and there's only one way to do it. It takes time. That's all there is. Okay. So, sentences make the difference. The sentence is your basic building block in narrative. I'm going to pass out this handout, okay? And there's a bunch of sentences on it. And these are from published works, fiction or creative nonfiction. It's not really important. There's all kinds of a way of starting. But it's the first line in the piece, whatever the piece is. It could be a book, it could be a story, it could be a memoir. So what I'm going to do is read these 19 opening sentences. And then after you've read it, you can, you can only pick one. Pick the one that, on the basis of this first sentence, you would most want to continue reading. Just one. Pretend like you only have five dollars and you've gone into a store and that you know you can you can only afford to buy one. That's why you tell them, right? It's like, hey, it's like your book, right? You know, you want to sell your book. See if you can get the reader after the first sentence. So, one, and then we'll see what everybody picks.
Okay, you all picked one? Okay, so let's go around, we'll go down the list and you can just put your hand up if you chose that one. Number one. I guess here because I saw that interesting. <laughs> Number two. Number three. Number four. Oh, okay, one person. Number five. Number six. Number seven. Aha. Uh -huh. Number eight. <coughs> okay. Number nine. Okay. Number ten. Number 11. <laughs> Number 12. Number 13. Number 14. <laughs> the perennially, the perennially popular one. <laughs> Number 15. Four. <laughs> Number 16. Number 17. Number 18. 19. Okay. All right, let's see number 14. Why do you want to read this one? <laughs> Tell me. Whoever chose it. Tell me why you want to read this one. Because I think um, it's very interesting because it, it says, it says the list. Says at least we don't know. We don't know the information is the shortest. Mm -hmm. It's a sentence with only two words. Mm -hmm. But uh, it can say some kind of uh, something illegal going on, mm -hmm. some kind of crime. Mm -hmm. But we have no information. So right. It's just kind of words. Mm -hmm. We want to know more. It's very short. And, uh, it is short, isn't it? It's the sh one of the shortest opening sentences I can find. But it is the most popular opening sentence every time I do this <laughs> workshop. <laughs> I almost always put it in because somebody always wants to read it. Um, well, on rare occasions people don't, but you know, most times they do. Why is it so powerful? It's what we don't know. It's what's not there that makes it powerful, right? It's the suspense. It's also the confessional nature of it. What Sue Silverman said about the confessional tone, I steal. Why are you telling me this? You know, shouldn't you hide this if you're stealing, right? What else do you want to know? Why? Why? What else do you want to know? What? What? <laughs> what? Is, this is this person stealing money? Is this person stealing what? You know? Um, so, it is interesting, isn't it? Just two words, and yet we all say, I don't need that one. All right. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you a key later that you can take away and you can find out for yourself. And I realized I made a mistake with the key, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that later. Um, number 10 got three votes as the number 16. Let's talk about number 10 first. Nobody in our neighborhood expected Chen Jin Li would come back. Why is that interesting? Because it was just like a pre-story. It's like a pre-story. It's like the story before the story, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think anything can happen there. Yeah. Maybe for positive, for negative. Yeah. Somebody searching for something uh -huh. in a certain place. What else? Why is it interesting? Why do you want to read this one? Uh, because I we learned in our uh, common department uh, course, there's uh, something called monomyths. People tend to think that actually in every culture. There's a kind of story that uh, everyone uh, kind of interested in, and it can set a journey to this person. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's come come yeah. back from a journey right. for a long time. Mm -hmm. So people want to know what kind of uh, journey she had, what kind of story she had from this absence. There are certain kinds of stories that are pretty universal in almost any culture and any language. Somebody leaves home and comes back. And that person is now a stranger in your own hometown. Right? This is a pretty universal story. We see it in many, many cultures. 
And there's the, you know, we know people who went away and came back in our homes, right? And, and, and maybe we ourselves have gone away and gone back. You know, Thomas Wolfe is a Tom Wolfe. This is Thomas Wolfe, who's a well-known American writer. He said, you can't go home again. That was the title of one of his books. And there's some truth to that. You really can't, because home changes when you go away and you come back. And you can't go home. Home can be where you came from. It could be the family you left behind. Like if you're a student who went abroad to study and you're going back home, you know, things like that. So it is a kind of universal story. And so it gets at us because we recognize it. We all know something like this. And in a place like Hong Kong, I think that's pretty common, too, probably. The other one that also got three, 16. It's easy to see the beginning of things and harder to see the end. Why did you all want to read this? Can relate to it. Yeah. We all can see the beginning, right? And you have no idea what's going to happen at the end. It's the middle that is fascinating, right? So. Presumably, this beginning will maybe take us to the middle of whatever this person is talking about, right? And it's just one sentence. Why is it a particularly powerful sentence, though? It also gives you the tension because uh, it gives a sense of disaster. Something is ending. Uh, people love here. Uh, people love here about disaster or trauma and end badly. So yeah, but well, yeah, tension. People's fight. And Mm -hmm. I think what you say about tension is true. The idea of, you know, putting two things in opposition to each other. That's always powerful in, in, in any kind of narrative, any kind of storytelling, you know? When you compare and contrast, why do we have essays to compare and contrast things? Because that sets up attention. I mean, that's one of the classic rhetorical things we use, you know? Anybody else? I would say something similar, but more like a personal fear of endings. A lot of us are scared of relationships or life ending mm -hmm. or any yeah. sort of sadness that's involved yeah. in it. Or just fear of the unknown will come back to that. It's the unknown. Anytime you can create a little mystery in storytelling, that's good. Where you don't give away everything right away, you know? Okay, let's see. Two votes went to number seven. The oddest places keep reappearing in my dreams, outlining the life I'm leading beneath the one I officially acknowledge. Why do you want to read that? Uh. It's about contradiction. Contradiction. And it seems like that it may be um, a, a journey of discovery. Mm -hmm. Some discovery. Yeah. Contradiction. But also the the interesting setup between the facade and the reality. Mm hmm. We all know the conscious self that we have and when we are out in public and talk to people. And then there's what you're really thinking. <laughs> we all know that. This is especially true at parties when you've got to shake a lot of hands of strangers, right? So I mean, we all understand this feeling that we have one face for out there and one face for in there. But he's put it into words in a rather interesting way. The right has put it into words in a rather interesting way. Um, we have some others. Ah, number four. In the woods waits the only person with whom I can be myself. Who chose this one? Yeah, tell me why. I, um, I actually read that waits the only person, that only person could be myself. Yeah, could be. Yeah, so who you can be myself totally. It could be a relationship story, yeah. but it could also um, sort of like suspension of thinking that, you know, like that's actually not another person but yourself. Well, the meaning is um, multi-layered. It could mean a number of things. Words have that power. You can make it do more for you than just what it says, right? Um, the man got out of the bed first. <laughs> number eight. Who wanted that one? Who chose that one? Yeah, tell me why. <laughs> I just think it because it is interesting. There is the man, then there may be the woman or the child or something else. Yes. And it's got out. It's not get out. So it is since it's past tense that means something's different. Mm. There is a story before or after mm. or 
that's the thing. And out of the bed is, I like the story that is some kind of like ordinary life. Yes. So, it is talking about some ordinary life or mm -hmm. it's routine, but their story before the man got out. And so, mm -hmm. And also there's a, all your, I don't know, maybe not all this, the sexual tension. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's a contrast. Because there's a man and a bed. The bed is like a moving to a place that you mm -hmm. share with the brain of people. Yeah. But the narrative says the man. So as if it's a stranger. Mm -hmm. So it hints said, I don't know, the person the who shared the bed with yeah. the stranger. So right. some kind of tension could be mm -hmm. sexual. Um, and also, it, it, it suggests that it could be sexual, and it's probably more likely a woman who might be in the bed, because if it were, let's say it was a gay couple, you can't say the man got out of the bed first, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's open. You know? Unless it's a man and a boy. But if the narrator, if the narrator says, even if the narrator is a man, you can say, oh, that man, the man got out of the bed. Well, that man got out of the bed. See, so the the or the that would make a difference. This is why one word can make so much difference. By saying the man got out of the bed first, it implies that the other person is not a man. Could be a child, could be a woman, could be okay? So if you want to suggest a sexual tension, it could be a, 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 an old man and a young girl. Okay? Um, so it's just the word the. But if you change it to that man, but he's the man. man because he's, if he's the first person error, it is like, oh, the man. But this is not first person. This is immediately third person. The man got out of the bed first. It's the third person. It's not first person. No, I mean, if the, uh, the narrator, mm -hmm. he, he is in the bed with the. Uh, but uh, that's just it. This is not yeah. a first person narrative. Okay. Because the man got out of the bed first immediately suggests, implies a third person narrative. So it's not first person. It can't be first person. Is the first person couldn't say it? Or is that way, you know? Um, somebody said they wanted to read. The first time I cheated that my husband and my mother had been dead for exactly one week. That was me. Yeah, <laughs> why? Because it's Saturday. You know, I realized that we're at the end of the term and over Saturday, I, might, I was torn between number six and number 14, guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there was something about the guilty pleasure nest yes. uh, yeah. that just called to me this morning. Yes. Yes. <laughs> also, as you said, there is a confessional nature going on. Um, <laughs> yep. It's confessional, yes. Yeah. But the juxtaposition of those two things I know. is fascinating. It is. It, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you can't not read on. It's like, <laughs> what the hell happened here, you know? Um, numbers 13. This too happens during an illness. Yeah, why did you want to read that one? Because uh, it contains similarities and differences. Uh, in, in the sense of similarities, because uh, almost everyone has experienced illnesses. So, what happens during this period of mm -hmm. adversity? So, uh, it's a, 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 a common thing. But uh, when we uh, say this happens, and the content of this varies uh, from person to person. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's a, a, a rich sentence. I think the two is the interesting word here. This two happens during illness. Um, because it's like, what are you talking about, you know? Um, and you're right, everybody knows what it's like to be ill. Right? But it's, it's setting up some kind of tension for us that we don't quite understand. Somebody want, her son wanted to talk again suddenly. Who wanted to? Why? I think the comma and the word suddenly is very powerful. Um, I've been met in two situations here. Yeah? The first one, probably uh, her son and her mm -hmm. didn't talk for, for a long time. time. Oh, okay. I have in the past, uh, 
that's, that's one set of opening sentences. Here's a second set for you to choose from. These are your opening sentences from your submissions. <laughs> this is why I wanted people to submit something before. Now, I've been written anonymous. So, um, in one case where somebody used their initials, I changed it to AA, okay? Um, and then um, in numbers 7 and 13, I just used A and B instead of the person's name. So now you can do the exact same exercise. Pick one. The opening sentences were very interesting. <laughs> they were very varied. Much more so than the ones I could pick out of the published work I was looking at. Is that you're all writing, not necessarily writing a story or writing, so there's a much wider range of writing. So I found it really quite interesting, <laughs> the opening sentences. And in such different forms also. Y'all pick one yet? And you can't pick your own. <laughs> You're not allowed to pick your own. That's the only rule here. You're not allowed to pick your own. All right. Let's go down the list and you tell me you pick that. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Uh, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten, number eleven, Number 12. Ah. Good. You 
found the one that's the popular one. Number 13. Number 14. Number 15. Number 16. 17. 18. Mm. I thought this might get a few people. <laughs> 19. All right, let's start with number 12. I named myself Lotus after several times of renaming. Why are we interested in that? Tell me. It's, it just uh, give, right away, you cannot give a linear progression of what this person, you can understand. Yes. Yeah. So it's a much more unusual yeah. way of introducing oneself, mm -hmm. you know? What else? Why, why was it? I was trying to open really interesting questions about identity and self-identity mm -hmm. and multiple identities. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very rich, right, in and of itself. It implies some, and we don't know, we don't know who this is, right? <coughs> Part of the reason why we read novels is they want to experience uh, like other people's lives, other people's identities. That's right. Yeah. So this person supposedly probably has a lot of different identities, so we, it kind of fulfills our fantasy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fantasy, it fulfills our fantasy. Part of what we read for is to find out what it's like to be someone else, to walk in someone else's shoes. So remember that in the narrative you craft. How can you make the reader want to read? You want to share with them something that entices them enough to feel like, oh, I'd like to know what that's like. I want to understand what that's like. And this was done in a very simple way. You know, it was like I named myself Lotus after several times of renaming. Several times. What does several mean? It could be two or three could be 15 or 20 times, you know? And whether it's 2 or 3 or 15 or 20, immediately makes it a different character. Now, since you were all sort of introducing yourself, or saying who you were, you can say that this was all a kind of nonfiction in a way, but you can do it in many different ways. But right away it means like, this is an interesting voice, an interesting character that we want to know about. You know, novels and stories are about characters, right? It's about what happens to all these different people and all that. And so we get interested in those people because of what they're willing to share about themselves. Let's go back to Silverman's confession and the confessional tone. It's amazing what confessions can do. <laughs> um, number 18, she was a true crossbreed or an unflinching turncoat. She was born Japanese, had lived as a North Korean, yet died as a South Korean. Why do we want to read this one? <laughs> I do. I want to read this one. <laughs> Partly because we know the relationships between those three places yes. and that they're full of conflict. And... Mm -hmm. The conflict right away is there, right? We're drawing on history, on factual knowledge that we all would have, right? What else? It's like a whole biography in one sentence. Yeah. And then you want to know what the details are. The ability to be concise to summarize the most powerful and unusual and salient details that make this character interesting is interesting. I also think it's really fascinating that it's a she, because in these kinds of historically, sort of politically interesting contexts, you seldom see a she. And so I want to know who was the she? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and to build on that, it's depressing how that still holds in a certain yes. way. I've been thinking about this a lot as I'm writing about men and leadership. Mm -hmm. Because if you can, I have to talk about women and leadership. And so we know a couple of women who have been very powerful globally, but women still don't narrate big stories. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I but, feel like this because it implies sorry, my memory, but then sort of, well, I don't know if it's going to be a happy ending, but. I mean, being able to get out of North Korea, right, which we know has happened, <laughs> end up somewhere it's else. not exactly easy. Yeah. There's, some, there's some kind of victory that happened there, even though, but it still could be a sad story. Sure. Yeah. The I words think, I found very interesting were true crossbreeds. Mm -hmm. Are they false crossbreeds? Mm -hmm. Is the 
first thought I had. And same thing, unflinching turncoat. Unflinching turncoat. The term cult. The term cult has very negative connotations, but an unflinching one. So that you were kind of told, well, unflinching, that's sort of brave, right? You know? What's going on? There's all these sort of opposing dynamics. And it's in the choice of words. You know, it, it's it, when you use an adjective, which we often counsel writers not to use too many of, they have to be just the right ones. An unflinching turncoat makes you want to read on, makes you want to think more about this. Um, number seven, A, whoever A is, I guess I have to interview you. Why do you want to read this one? <laughs> Um, I chose this one because um, I'm curious about why they use have to. Ha have to. Yes. Um, this feels like the interview, in, the interviewee is an important person, and then the interviewer has no choice but have to interview. Yeah. So, which is interesting and uh, a unique way to start an interview. Yep. There's an emotion there. You know, I have to interview you. I must. You know. Um, but I have to is, is, is powerful. Somebody else chose this too? I didn't choose it, but I'm intrigued also by the word guess in there. The thing I guess is really Yes, I have to. I don't really want to, but. I guess more I than like, should. Also. It's more than like, it's something different than if someone's holding a gun to your head and saying, like, I have to interview you. That's yes. sort of right. something different there. So much in just a few words, right? Um, as my 56th birthday approaches, I feel like Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire who declares he has lost the ability to bullshit. <laughs> a couple of you want to read this slide. Of course, it makes you laugh. Yes, it does. Yeah. Humor is laugh. great. Yeah, humor is always great. Makes you laugh. And also, this kind of universal appeal that everyone, we, we're used to Hollywood movies. Almost mm -hmm. everyone knows this movie, so we mm -hmm. kind of like kind of personal connection to the narrative. Yeah. Well, anybody not know these movie stars? Anybody not familiar? Okay. Anybody else? The only danger when you cite pop culture, of course, is that you're going to leave some people out. But that's okay, I guess. You know, nothing is really universal. But there's always somebody who hasn't heard of what you've heard of. But, you know, it's pretty hard to find something completely universal. Um, we like to think that there's a lot of universal things Actually, it's probably less than we think, especially in popular culture. Um, it's something we often counsel our students, our creative writers, you know, be careful of pop culture because they can. But I, you know, Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire are pretty big, <laughs> so we tend to know who they are. Um, a Chinese in Hong Kong, somebody wanted to read this. Who was that? Yeah, why? Because uh, I liked it because it's being extra, extra ordinary by like being ordinary. Because Especially people who read a lot of fictions, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're kind of familiar with all the literary beautiful languages, but this mm -hmm. one seems so honest to me. Yes. It's like without bullshit, so I just mm -hmm. want to read about it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an unusual way of expressing um, an introduction of self, right? A Chinese in Hong Kong. It says something, it's very definitive in the one hand. On the other hand, we know how complicated the question of being Chinese in Hong Kong is, you know, or how complicated the question of Hong Kong is. AA is so different from most of us. Somebody wanted to read this one. Yes. I chose it because uh, I'm interested in how people project and put people in pigeonhole and what happened to those people that are being defined differently. Right. And this is somebody saying that X, you know, I didn't want to put a name in, is so different from most of us. So right away, it's a question of you know the other in some fashion. Um, she's traditional and open-minded, number six, and critical and careless and well-planned and cool and cheerful. That's a whole lot of adjectives. <laughs> Who wanted to read this one? Why? It's just again the juxtaposition of, yeah. of every contradiction that you would imagine, uh -huh. and then you would you want to know more. Of course. <laughs> Design makes it interesting, right? You know, all these different things. And most of us are a mass of contradictions. There are very few people who are so consistent all the time, right? <laughs> I mean, I wish we were, but we're not. And that's just the truth of it. You know? 
you know, we're nice one moment, we're not so nice another moment, right? So, um, so it's honest, isn't it, in, in many ways. Number 14, what's a lefty plastic? Imagine to influence the men in China with integrity, one of the values learned on the British colonial education, turn into localism after stars, believe in persuasion of all the history and culture are more important, but have no guts to scare a Who wanted to read this one? Yeah, why? What's well, a screenplay? Yeah, it could be. It really could be. Yeah. I mean, just there, there are so many current and interesting references, mm -hmm. as, so, as this speaks to my inner historian. Mm -hmm. well. But on a, on a lot of levels, I think it's a story that you know we're all interested in understanding more about. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah I, I, I liked this one. I thought, wow, this says a lot, and especially the last bit. But have no guts to scare a That's pretty honest, right? You know, that's pretty you know out there and just saying, hey, I have all these ideals, but and here's a big but, you know. But it's honest, it feels real, it feels like what most people feel. Most of us have these ideals, but there's a certain line over which we won't go, right? So that's, that's asking us to think about that. Number 15, I never knew that I could not be away from the water for too long until I was landlocked for over a year. Who chose that one? Oh, yeah, why? Could be an animal, yeah. <laughs> that, that's sort of interesting, right? You could, you could make this an animal. You could make this a story about an animal. Um, I think the idea of a discovery that's happening for whoever the speaker is is interesting because a lot of about a lot of narrative, a lot of storytelling is about what the main character, the protagonist, discovers. Because if there's no discovery in the story, then why do you want to read this person's story? If this person can tell you, this is the way I was at 10, and this is the way I am now, and nothing has changed, you think, terrific, next. You know, I mean, why do you need to know anything more, right? Whereas this is like saying, I didn't know this about myself until this happened. Which is more like what most of us experience, really. We really don't know what we think we know until we come through something. So it's something to identify with. Number 19, I think, right? I remember a very special moment with my nephew, eight years old. I was chatting with my brother on my new challenges in life. Somebody chose this, yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree with what you said, but I think that the nephew has done. Yeah. those conversations. Right, right. Because children sort of eavesdropping on adult conversation you have something interesting to say. <laughs> yeah. So, one of the exercises I sometimes do, I'm not going to do today, is then ask you which ones you wouldn't choose to read in one. <laughs> now, you know, that is part of the pedagogy, you know, we critique each other's work quite a lot, but, you know, I'm not here to, like, make anybody feel bad about the own writing. Um, but you can think about that for yourself. Why would I read this one? Why would I choose this one? And does it say more about you, or does it say more about what's written? Because we have, we have prejudices as readers also. So let's think a little bit about re revision. Um, because in, you're all in academia, so you probably do write quite a lot. You're, but you should do a lot of critical work, papers, research, whatever. Um, and you're probably all quite competent with language because you have to do it. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't actually be researching narrative or trying to write it. I suspect most. I don't know, you think, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think you all pretty much like language on some level. Sorry to the pause, but what's coming up for me is how academic writing is at odds with yeah. good writing. It is. Academic writing can be stultifyingly bad. Um, it's one of the reasons I didn't become an academic. I, I couldn't write.
write like that for the rest of my life. <laughs> 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 I really do, um, and I've seen it. You know, I've been in business, so I've looked at sort of uh, business kind of writing, which can be really stultifyingly dull or really quite lively. And likewise, if you look in the, you know, I'm, I'm in the humanities. You know, you can look at critical work in the humanities, and some of it is really horrifying. You know, and others because it's so common jargon, and others can be really quite enlightening. You read what somebody has written about, a text that you know, for example, and it really enlightens you. It shows you another way of, of reading about it. I think that clear language is always the goal of good writing. Uh, I, you know, the reliance on, I, I know in academic writing you have to do your references, you have to, but there are a thousand ways to do references that could be more original than just citing over and over again. And, um, it can be pretty horrifying if all we're doing is just making sure I have all my references, making sure I have all my, you know, making sure, all, you know, it's like, it's not about me. It's like, what is it you want to say? I think we stop there, the why of it. That's where the good writing in um, critical work that I've seen comes from. I mean, I've seen good writing, you know, you have good science writing. And you have science writing that, unless you're a scientist, you really can't understand, you know? And I like to think that the sciences could be comprehensible to those of us who are halfway educated, you know? Why should it be so difficult? Why should any subject be so difficult? And I think a lot of times the simplifying of things, like I steal, this could be a case study on, you know, kleptomania, you know what I mean? Um, just gets it down to the basics. Or a Chinese in Hong Kong, the one that you picked up. Basic. This is the colors of me, Jane. That's it is. Wow. <laughs> that was weird. I like that. Um, so I think this idea of explaining the brilliant ideas to reading to readers, it's not just describing the idea. It's taking it apart. It's putting it out there and, and considering it fully. Um, it's being careful with language. You know what I said about first drafts and how they crap? They are. Because you know when we write them, it's this big rush, we just write it. So when you step back and revise and rethink, what is it I was really trying to say? That's when we know. So let's do a little revision. You wrote two paragraphs that have opening sentences. The one that you submitted, which is on the handout that you just got, and the one that we did in the writing exercise three, right before the break. Right? I said, write something that you're interested in. Look at your own opening sentences. Can you rewrite your opening sentences to make each one more compelling, to make the reader want to read on? So take your two opening sentences and write two new opening sentences. And let's see where you go. So one of them is the one that you submitted, the one that was on the handout just now, and the other one is the one from the exercise you did just before the break. Let's try and revise and see what happens.
Ja, wir müssen uns das jetzt und dann wieder bei jedem. So, opening sentences are great, but um, it's not the only thing, right? The sentence has to lead to something else. So now, we're going to read the sentences that came after those opening sentences, not the ones that you guys wrote, but from the published world. So, <laughs> here's the handout. 